All right, panelists, we are now live to Zoom and Facebook, and you can switch your cameras on. Welcome, 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 Aziza, welcome, Ronaldo. Hi, Maya, welcome, welcome. Hello to people at home. I can see people are still kind of streaming in. Um, it's great to see you. It's great to see you all. Um, good evening. A uh, huge welcome to Ronaldo, Maya, Aziza, and Matt. Um, big welcome to everyone at home as well. Thank you for joining us and for tuning in. This is Out of Sight, Ending Canada's Armed Drone Purchase. And it's a discussion featuring Ronaldo Walcott, Aziza Kanji, and Matt Korda on the need to end Canada's killer drone purchase. We'll also be joined by uh, Maya Garfinkel uh, with some words on the campaign against the armed drones and the ways that you can support and take action. So I'm Bianca Majeni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign po Policy Institute, and we're one uh, of the organizers of today's discussion. I also want to thank the co-presenting organizations of today's event, World Beyond War Canada, Just Peace Advocates, and the Yellowhead Institute. So please do find out more about these groups who are doing uh, important work in Canada. I'm coming to you from Montreal or Jojage on the territory of the Ganyangehaga people and the keepers of the Eastern door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, I also recognize the continued presence of the Métis, Innu and Inuit people on this land. So thank you, thanks again for joining us uh, today. After um, this introduction, our speakers are gonna give their remarks and then we're gonna take about half an hour for questions from the audience following that. So please do put your questions in the Q and A um, and uh, it's much easier for us to find them there than in the general chat. Um, also Karen Rodman from Just Peace Advocates will be posting useful links and resources and actions that you can take in, uh, in the chat. So today's event, um, Out of Sight, uh, is about Canada's plan to purchase up to $5 billion Canadian dollars worth of armed drones. Uh, so Ottawa is seeking uh, remotely piloted aircraft that can acquire targets, missiles. Um, their letter of interest to potential suppliers includes uh, awful scenarios from drone use uh, in, for drone use abroad and domestically, things like bombing targets in Afghanistan, um, to surveilling pro uh, public protests in Toronto. And so rather than making us safer, uh, armed drones threaten lives, both here and around the world. They're used in extrajudicial executions, surveillance of targeted populations, and other violations of human rights. And what's more, this $5 billion, which does not include maintenance costs over their 25-year life cycle, is Canadian taxpayer dollars that could be spent to help lift boil water advisories on reserves or build social housing or uh, invest in renewable energy projects. Despite all of this, uh, the procurement has received very little coverage and very little pushback so far. Uh, but it's important to note that the contract for the drone purchase has not yet been awarded. So now is the time to speak out against the purchase. And tonight we'll be hearing from experts and activists about this purchase and what we can do about it. Um, so the first speaker of the evening is Matt Corda. It's my great pleasure uh, to present Matt, who is a senior research associate and project manager for the, for the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. Matt is also an associate researcher uh, with the Weapons of Mass Destruction Program at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. He's also the co-director of Foreign Policy Generation, which is a group of young people working to develop a progressive foreign policy for the next generation. His research interests and recent publications focus on disarmament, progressive foreign policy, and the nexus between nuclear weapons, climate change, and injustice. Matt's work has been widely published and quoted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, BBC, AP, the Toronto Star, uh, The Nation, and many others. Uh, and Matt's also a member of the Canadian Pugwash Group. Welcome, Matt. Thank you so much, um, and thank you for that really, really kind introduction. Um, I will just actually, you know, I'll share my screen in a minute, but just really, really quickly um, for folks who don't know me, um, my name is Matt Corda, and I'm I'm uh, mostly you may have seen like some of the stuff that we do in the states um, with the Federation of American Scientists. We are mostly a nuclear weapons organization. That being said, in this particular context, um, we work a lot at the intersection of uh, emerging technologies and disarmament and things like that. And so um, I'm here today sort of in a, a capacity of 
looking into disarmament issues more broadly. Um, I'm a Canadian from Toronto, even though I work in the United States. And so I try and bring uh, a perspective of um, research and analysis on different types of military systems to this particular issue. And so Bianca has asked me to help uh, frame this discussion for the first 10-ish minutes or so by providing a, a quick overview of the drone procurement program, um, what we actually know about uh, how these systems might be used, and then um, some major concerns, which I think uh, we'll, we'll talk about a lot more as well. And so just a, a really quick note um, on acronyms, because you'll see a few of them, or you may have heard a few of them. Um, the government documents use a few acronyms interchangeably, um, the most prominent of which being RPAS or RPAS, which stands for Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems or UAS, Unmanned Aerial Systems. Um, I'll show a few documents that we've managed to get from uh, government sources, things like that, some stuff which they just post publicly uh, as part of the procurement and industry initiatives. Um, I'll just use drone because I think it is the, the most just universally recognized um, just to make things a little more accessible. Um, so really quickly, I'll just uh, make sure to share this. Sorry, it's giving me a bit of trouble. Why is that? There we go. All right, you're going to see it in, in uh, partly in document mode because it's the rest of it is, uh, is giving me a little bit of trouble, but that's OK. So um, the drone program in Canada has existed in some shape or form um, since about 2005 when the, the Royal Canadian Air Force uh, Armed Forces formally stood up a project known as uh, Just As um, to develop a series of requirements for procuring a drone capability for Canada. And so for roughly the next decade, um, the, the RCAF, they sort of honed those requirements by consulting with allies. And then uh, between 2008 and 2011, um, they actually leased three Israeli drones, uh, which is a, a system called the Heron, um, which we'll discuss in a minute, because it's actually one of the ones that is now being offered back to Canada as part of this purchase, um, to conduct surveillance and target designation operations in Afghanistan. And so the, the program itself has sort of gone through a, a number of fits and starts, and it's been subject to substantial delays. Um, the original delivery date of 2017 has now been pushed roughly about a decade to about 2026. Um, and you know sometimes that happens because of normal delays in the procurement process. Um, but these delays in particular, I think, can partly be attributed to delays in the operational requirements. So in terms of how Canada is actually going to use these systems and the advancement of the technology itself, right? So the, the commander of uh, the armed forces said at the time, um, you know, he had this quote, if you commit too early to a very expensive program, uh, there are new ones coming in not far behind that did you, give you different capabilities that will be much cheaper. And so the Canadian government sort of adopted this like wait and see approach to drone procurement for, for many years. Um, finally, in 2017, um, Trudeau's defense policy announced uh, that Canada would officially acquire uh, a drone system and things move forward relatively quickly from there. So project approval was granted in 2019. The formal request for proposals to industry partners which was issued in uh, February 2022. Um, and then the contract is supposed to be awarded 2024, first delivery 26, and then full operational capability, meaning the entire complement of drones being delivered in the, in the uh, early 2030s. And so unlike the United States, which uses different types of drones for different missions. Um, the, the expectation is that Canada will deploy a single type of drone. This, this accounts partially for some of the delays that we're seeing to the program because the list of mission requirements just keeps growing and changing and you know the military is adding different things to it, taking things away. And so um, the, the systems that are uh, most sort of optimal for those requirements keep changing as well. And so with all that being said, this is sort of what we know about the system um, via either unclassified or, or leaked uh, documents. So we know that it'll be a, a medium altitude, long endurance uh, drone specializing in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions. Um, it'll also be capable of conducting precision strikes, um, as Bianca mentioned, with uh, Hellfire missiles, other precision guided munitions. Um, it's supposed to be able to operate in all weather, day or night, 
has to be able to operate in a congested domestic civil airspace, which I think we'll talk about a bit. And uh, the idea is that it will uh, have a 25 year service life. And so um, we, sorry, I skipped ahead on my slides. Uh, so in terms of uh, teams, there are two teams that have essentially been, the government has sort of whittled this down to. Um, there's team Sky Guardian, uh, which is led by General Atomics um, and Team Artemis, which is led by L3 Harris uh, and Israel Aerospace Industries. Um, both bidding teams would utilize many of the same companies to provide subcomponents for the drone system, including, uh, for example, they would have the same sensor, right? The Westcam sensor, which is built in Burlington. Um, if you're wondering why you may have heard that name before, it's because it made news uh, quite recently by playing a key role in the conflict between. Armenia and Azerbaijan in 2021, which featured pretty significant drone combat use and ultimately claimed uh, over 5,000 lives. And those Canadian made sensors, which were originally intended to be used by Turkey, were incorporated onto Turkish made drones and then illicitly diverted to Azerbaijan when they were then used on the battlefield explicitly against Canada's export control uh, agreement with Turkey. Um, this was all done and documented really, really well by um, colleagues at, at Project Plowshares and then also by um, folks in the Globe and Mail. It led to the government actually canceling the export permits with Turkey entirely. Uh, but because both of these teams plan to use that sensor, it will almost certainly be incorporated onto Canada's drone system as well. So uh, Team Sky Guardian is offering a version of the, the MQ-9B, which is um, primarily in service with the US military. Team Artemis is offering variant of the Israeli Heron, um, which is the same system that Canada used to operate in Afghanistan. Uh, it's primarily used by the Israeli uh, military. So we have two sort of national national government teams here uh, competing for for uh, Canadian Canadian tax dollars. So um, now you know the the current RFP, which sort of details a lot about what the military requirements are, is not available to the public. Um, I have asked the Canadian government for it a few times. They have declined to give it to me. Um, but the 2016 request for information for industry partners provides some pretty interesting insights into what Canada would actually use this system for. And so the document included um, seven fictional, but uh, the, the intention is that they're highly realistic scenarios to convey mission priorities to industry. And if you haven't seen it, um, you should read Aziza's amazing piece for the Yellowhead Institute that provides a, a great rundown of all seven scenarios. But um, to, to save some time, I'll just, I'm gonna go into really two of them here because the scenarios range from ones that I think, you know, on the sliding scale, some are relatively benign, like facilitating search and rescue missions or things like that, to things that um, I think are, are quite concerning. And so two of them in particular, um, we'll, we'll talk about really briefly. And the first is what the government uh, calls a domestic overland ISR uh, sortie. And the scenario that they lay out is that the drone is effectively tasked to support RCMP security operations at a G20 summit held near Quebec City. And the idea is they're meant to um, conduct surveillance of the crowd and report anything threatening to the RCMP. And so the scenario notes in the, in the preambles that, you know, there have been several groups that have indicated their intent to protest um, and they have, you know, an anti-capitalist cause and so they want to disrupt the summit. And so on the, on the side here, you'll see um, a, a timeline that the government has put together how the drone will be used in this kind of fictional scenario. Uh, the timeline is actually a lot longer than what I've included here, but I've included just the most sort of interesting and concerning sections. So you'll see that a uh, uh, the drone operators observe a car parked in a field. They use infrared sensors to indicate the engine is warm. Um, and then they report the car's location to the security team. And then they see that you know, the occupants are just some kind of underage drinking teenagers. They get immediately handed over to the police. And then the drone operators spot another vehicle driving towards the summit and they get a security team to intercept it. Uh, and they ascertain that the individuals were attempting to hang a banner concerning global warming. Um, so you can see here just one, one uh, scenario under which you know, these drones are, you know, would be used for uh, a surveillance operation on Canadian soil. The next scenario takes place in Afghanistan and the drone is tasked with providing early warning of visible threats to Canadian soldiers on the ground. 
And the timeline here you'll see is, I think, a lot more sinister than the last. Um, the drone operators spot three uh, what they call fighting age males, or that's that acronym FAM, um, on a road. There's a wire on the ground and that one of them is holding a cell phone. And the use of force is then subsequently authorized and the drone operators launch a precision guided munition at the three men who have been labeled as combatants. So just to sort of wrap up, um, I wanna present you know, some major concerns that I think stand out to me um, and perhaps others as well um, for perhaps brainstorming and discussion. And so the first concern that I have is that the Afghanistan scenario is clearly a mirror image of how the United States uh, conducts its own drone operations right down to the language that is used to describe uh, folks like quote, fighting age males. I think over the years, and I think um, many folks here have written about this quite extensively, there has been enough information about US drone policy that has come out to indicate that the US labels effectively all military age males, meaning over 16 um, in a strike zone as combatants, unless there is explicit intelligence posthumously proving them otherwise, um, which is really concerning, right? And can could result potentially in Canada using its drones to uh, kill civilians, even without Canadians knowing about it. This stands, I think, in pretty stark contrast to Canada's, I think, relative record of advocating for the protection of civilians in armed conflict. So this stands, you know, sort of in, in direct contrast to that. Another set of concerns um, relates to the, the first scenario I put forward about domestic surveillance um, and the disruption of Canadians' uh, fundamental right to peacefully protest. Uh, I think we know at this point that during the BLM protests in the States in 2020, U.S. domestic security forces use drones to surveil protesters in 15 cities. So this happens on a, on a regular basis. Um, we also know that police in Canada are increasingly incorporating facial recognition technologies into their work. And when you couple that with domestic surveillance drones, uh, things get pretty scary, right? And there are also concerns, I think, about the potential conflict between drones and civil airspace. Um, remember the note on the earlier slide, they had to operate in a congested airspace. And so there's you know, always the potential for accidents with these things. Um, additionally, I'm concerned about the potential for drones to be deployed in a domestic airspace equipped with lethal armaments. Um, and you'll see here a quote from a Canadian government source who said that uh, while RPAS will not need to routinely carry weapons during operations in Canadian airspace, situations may arise that would require such capabilities. Uh, what situations are they talking about? Um, I, I don't know, and absent any additional clarification, uh, that kind of thing makes me very nervous. And then finally, um, there's the issue of cost, which Bianca already mentioned. Um, the system is projected to cost between uh, one and $5 billion, um, which is a lot of money to spend on a system um, that, uh, from my perspective, is both unnecessary and, and dangerous. And that would, I think, be true if we were not already also facing simultaneous and overlapping crises like a global health pandemic and uh, you know, rising uh, food prices in grocery stores and all, all sorts of other things. Um, but I think at this stage, it's, it's clearly an investment in the wrong kind of security. And so uh, that's it for me for now. And um, I hope that was useful. And I'm excited to get down to questions and brainstorming with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. That was uh, such an excellent presentation. I really appreciated the clarity. Um, it was so comprehensive and very concerning to hear about the implications, the very serious implications um, of this drone procurement program. Um, so thank you for all the research that you've done. And um, I look forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. And for those of um, for those of you that are wondering, we will be rebroadcasting this discussion to both YouTube and uh, I'm on Facebook. Um, so a reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll get immediate notifications. Also, I see people have started putting their questions in the Q&A box. That's great. We'll get to them uh, at the end. All right. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Aziza Kanji. Aziza is a legal academic and writer. She received her Juris Doctor from the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law and Master's of Law specializing in Islamic Law from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Aziza's work focuses on issues relating to racism, law, and social justice. Her writing has appeared regularly in Canadian and international media including Al Jazeera at English, the Toronto Star, National Post, Ottawa's, Ottawa Citizen, um, and various uh, 
academic anthologies, journals, and, and much more. Aziza also serves as Director of Programming at the Nora Cultural Center. Welcome, Aziza. Thank you, Bianca. Um, I want to start by reminding myself that I'm speaking from the colonized land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas people. And when we're talking about drones, we must remember that this colonization of indigenous land is not only horizontal extending across space, but also uh, in the words of critical Israeli theorist, um, I.L. Weitzman, it's also a vertical occupation extending beneath the ground uh, in, in, in the name of colonial extractivism of oil and gas and other resources, and now increasingly with the deployment of drones extending far into the sky uh, for the purposes of surveillance and repression of indigenous land and water defenders. So thank you, uh, Bianca, Karen, Maya, for all your work organizing this unfortunately very timely webinar. Thank you to Matt for your presentation and for all your research. Thank you to Ronaldo for all the work that you do to help us understand and push back against entrenched systems of state violence. At the previous webinar we had on Canada's armed drone purchase, I went through the various different um, hypothetical use scenarios outlined the government's letter of interest for um, their application of drones and how these scenarios help us to think about the connections between different faces of state violence that we often analyze and address in ways that are separate from each other. The connection between domestic policing, international policing, anti-Indigenous colonization, um, anti-migrant border enforcement and war. And so it's actually very fitting, I think, that we're having this next webinar on the day after Valentine's Day, because I think exercising solidarity against these forms of state violence in the face of the logics that make us think that these are separate struggles is actually an exercise of love not this neoliberal privatized love that makes us think that our care is something that's uh, finite and that should just be restricted to those closest to us, but actually the purest, deepest expression of love, a love which connects our struggles and builds movements as, as strong as the and interconnected as the forms of state violence that we confront. What I want to do today is to highlight some of what I think are the salient features of drones as instruments of violence um, that are central for us in thinking about why and how that we resist them. First, drones are by nature, by design, instruments of unilateral violence. Indeed, this is the very basis of their appeal for actors of state aggression. The fact that they permit those who wield them to inflict death and surveillance while remaining invulnerable and invisible themselves. Indeed, when we look at the various different scenarios in the letter of interest about who these drones would be applied against, illegal migrants, um, indigenous land and water defenders who aren't described in the letter of interest, but we know that this is how the Canadian state has in fact already been using them to surveil indigenous land and water defenders, um, illegal migrants, fighting aged males in Afghanistan, anti-capitalist protesters, um, Somali pirates who, as we know from critical research, are demonized even though they are in fact responding to the depredation of their, of their waters and their lands by unregulated transnational corporations. The through line that connects all of these figures as targets of drones is the fact that they are, are depicted as being legitimate targets of almost unlimited state violence while being denied whether in fact or in law the right to use violence or even in many cases, nonviolence resistance in return. So this is the first feature of drones that we should be aware of, that they are by design and implementation instruments of unilateral violence against those who are denied any right to defend themselves against them. Second, this unilateralism of drones violence indicates to us how they are in fact an extension of colonial technologies of control. Drone warfare and the war on terror in general is often depicted as an aberration or a new configuration of violence because of the way that it combines the logic of war with the logic of police in order to expand the state's right to use violence 
uh, while restricting and, and narrowing the restrictions on the use of that violence to produce, on the other end, people who are targeted by almost unlimited violence, but are um, the violence of war, but are denied any right to use violence in return. But the only reason that this appears to us as an aberration is precisely because the entire history of colonial violence, which for many periods of history has in fact been the predominant form of military violence inflicted, the war on terror only appears as an aberration because the entire history of colonial violence has largely been erased. In colonial contexts, we saw how the colonized and the dispossessed were not only punished and penalized and prohibited from returning violence with nonviolence with violence or even nonviolence resistance in return but in many fact were actually ordered to pay compensation to those who had tortured massacred enslaved and dispossessed them to and we see the continuation of this in the way that um people on the other side of drones and the war on terror have been prosecuted and penalized for using violence, not against US civilians, but even against, against US soldiers. War, as harsh and as violent a term as this is, is still a euphemism for, for this mode of violence because war is predicated on the idea legally that um, combatants may use violence and are subject to using violence in return. They're vulnerable to having violence applied against them in return. But what this is actually is not war, but again, a unilateral application of violence. It's far more akin to what the Nazi jurist and political theorist Carl Schmitt, whose theories have seen a revival in the context of the war on terror, it's far more akin to what Carl Schmitt referred to as social pest control, in which those on the other end of the violence are seen not as combatants to be defeated, but as, as vermin to be extinguished. We see this very clearly in the type of language that has been used in the context of the war on terror uh, in, in drone strikes, uh, whether the targets being described as ants by drone operators to be exterminated, or those who are killed referred to as bug splat. Language that is extremely revealing of, of the systems of ideology that rationalize not only violence against humans, but also against the non-human natural world, which is depicted as a domain to be dominated and, and subject to, to lethal force. Third, like other forms of colonial violence, drones cloak themselves in a pretension of humanitarianism and benevolence and technological sophistication. The myth that drones are a more precise form of inflicting lethal force uh, has been used to present drones not as a humanitarian catastrophe or humanitarian threat, but in fact as a humanitarian innovation that's making warfare in fact an exercise of benevolence. But we know this is a myth from looking at, uh, at the statistics which organizations, despite the layers of secrecy placed on drone violence, have managed to obtain. Uh, data uh, analyzed in Foreign Policy magazine, for example, showed that drone strikes have a rate of causing civilian casualties 35 times greater than piloted um, aircrafts and munitions. The British organization NGO Reprieve <laughs> found that despite depictions of drones very precisely targeting uh, those who are legitimate targets of violence, uh, that the US had in fact reported the same military leaders killed on average uh, three times, and some were reported killed as many as seven times, and that in the course of targeting supposedly precisely 41 leaders, more than 1,000 unknown people were killed. Larry Lewis, who was a, an advisor to the Department of Defense in, um, in compiling uh, civilian casualty reports, points out that since he worked for them in 2007, there were 2,000 incidents of civilian casualties, and that since the beginning of the war on terror 20 years ago, this amounts to an average of at least one civilian casualty incident per week for 20 years. And yet, despite this, and despite the vast resources that we know the Department of Dis Defense expends on, on American militar militarism, they have not one dedicated person um, ensuring that harm to civilians is reduced. The problem 
is not a lack of technological sophistication, a lack of ability to discern using drone cameras, who is a legitimate target and who is not. Rather, the problem is deeply racialized ways of seeing that depict certain people as being inherently threatening, that insist on seeing women clad in jewelry as military aged men, that see children as dogs walking on two legs who can be targeted. And that, as Matt said, see any um, man or boy who looks possibly over the age of 16 as being inherently a security threat deserving of extermination from the sky. As with the failure of uh, police body cams to eliminate or even really reduce police violence, we see that the problem is not the absence of technologically sophisticated ways of seeing and recording violence, but rather the presence of deeply racist and colonial narratives justifying that violence to continue. Fourth is the complete absence of any redress or remedy or even basic accountability for those who are on the targeting and receiving end of this violence. The presumption that has been built into international law about why states would adhere to restrictions and accountability mechanisms in their exercises of violence is that because all parties are equally vulnerable, they're all equally invested in, in having uh, accountability and restrictions and systems of control. This presumption of equality of vulnerability disappears in the instance of drones. In the words of one American general, they permit uh, state militaries to project power without projecting vulnerability. And so any investment in having mechanisms of control or restriction disappear in the situation of drones. We know, for example, that while the US's pullout of boots on the ground from Afghanistan has been depicted as an advancement or progress, in reality, um, even the very paltry sums of condolence payments that are uh, paid to victims of drone attacks they completely bottom out and even disappear in situations where the American military feels that none of their personnel are at risk. And so even the couple of thousands of dollars that victims of drone strikes may get in the, um, in the event that one of their loved ones is killed as the price for a taken life, even that disappears uh, in the absence of American military personnel on the ground. For example, the Yemeni victim, a uh, survivor of a drone strike that burned half of his body, was denied any compensation by the US military and in fact was forced to rely on a public GoFundMe in order to save his life. The courts have proven no bulwark or protection of people's fundamental rights in these cases. Even when they acknowledge that rights are at stake, they have contorted themselves absolutely to provide a variety of justifications, rationalizations to dismiss these cases from the courts. In the case of Anwar al awlaki for example, an American citizen who was on the US kill list and who, along with his 16-year-old son, were subsequently killed in drone strikes, when his family tried to challenge his placement on the kill list in advance, the courts said, a, well, you can't challenge it as his family in court because there's no reason why he can't just walk into a court and challenge it himself as if he was not on a kill list. And second, that it's not clear that it's a violation of his rights because this is only a prospective hypothetical future drone strike uh, instead of one that's actually be completed. So if he's actually killed, then maybe you can challenge it. In other words, atrocities can only be challenged after the fact. In the Canadian case, to me, it's terrifying that as bad as this American system is, Canada has provided even less transparency about what its legal framework is for using drones, what are limitations, restrictions, uh, what are potential uh, remedies for those who have, been, who have been targeted. And this is particularly concerning because as Matt points out, Canada's uh, use of, armed, of these armed drones is actually authorized not only in war contexts abroad, but also for a variety of domestic applications within Canada itself. So we have less transparency about the legal framework with potentially uh, expanded use. The way that we, or the language that we use to describe these ways that legal formalism, these minutia of law are used as an instrument to justify exercises of raw violence and, and domination, the term we often use to describe these is Kafkaesque. That's the only word to describe the, the 
the way that courts have completely abdicated the responsibility to provide any measure of, of remedy or oversight for these uh, exercises of drone violence. The term we often use for these is Kafkaesque, but I learned something recently about Kafka as, but as I've been reading more about him that might help us think about another way in which we ourselves can be Kafkaesque, which is Kafka died thinking of himself as a failure. He wanted uh, his works to be burned. He died thinking that he had failed. And yet we know now that he has provided us with a language and a framework that's essential for thinking about the way that state violence operates. American generals have said that one of the purposes of drones is to exercise such overwhelming power that the people on the other side of them feel that resistance is futile, that they have no choice but to, sub but to submit, to lie down and take whatever state power is inflicted upon them. But we know from histories of movements challenging even those forms of state violence that seem to be the most entrenched and intractable, that resistance is never futile and that perhaps like Kafka, Kafka, even if we might not see the immediate results of our work, even in our lifetimes, they may sow possibilities and opportunities for different futures that we can't even imagine right now. And so I look very much forward to hearing from the other panelists, uh, both about our histories of resistance and how they might help us think about our current moment, as well as planning for the future. Thank you again, everyone. And um, I look forward to, the, to discussing with all of you. Thank you, Aziza. What a compelling presentation from Aziza. Very sobering analysis um, of these chilling instruments um, that, you know, that as, as you call them, uni unilateral violence, these instruments of unilateral violence. Um, and also thank you for bringing us back to the question of love, which is so much of what drives our resistance, you know, to war to these killer drones. So please do read Aziza's excellent article for the Yellowhead Institute. Um, it's posted in the chat and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you during the Q&A. Um, I also just wanna let people know that you can take a minute to write to the Canadian Minister of Defense. Um, the link is in the chat there um, and uh, you can write to them and tell them that, this, uh, that they should not uh, move forward with this purchase. So check that out and take action. So next up, we have Ronaldo Walcott. Very excited to uh, present Ronaldo. Um, Ronaldo is an associate professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and the director of the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. As an interdisciplinary scholar, uh, Ronaldo has published on music, literature, film, theater, and policy, among other topics. Ronaldo's research is concerned with the ways in which coloniality shapes Human Relations Across Social and Cultural Time. Ronaldo is the author of The Long Emancipation, Moving Toward Black Freedom on Property, Black Life, Post-BLM and the Struggle for Freedom, Queer Returns and Black Like Who, uh, among others. Um, Ronaldo is also the editor of Rude, Contemporary Black Canadian Cultural Criticism. Ronaldo's research and publications focus on Black cultural politics, histories of colonialism in the Americas, multiculturalism, citizenship, and diaspora, gender and sexuality, and social, cultural, and public policy. Welcome, Ronaldo. Thank you, Bianca, for um, the lovely introduction. I'm going to make one tiny revision, which is to say that tonight I am coming to you from the territory of the Seneca Nation of the Haudenosaunee. Some of you might know it as Buffalo, where I have the camp <laughs> from Toronto. It's, it's about six weeks. I'm now, um, I'm now professor and chair of the Department of Africana Studies and American Studies at the University of Buffalo. So <laughs> um, that's where I am now. Um, I, I've, I've been thinking about what it is, how I might frame the question of Canada's um, drone program in relationship to what I think um, we might need to spend some time thinking about more broadly, which is that since 9-11, um, we've been seeing a transformation of Canada's um, foreign policy um, as significantly much more hawkish. So of course we know we know the fundamental myth of Canada as a peacekeeping nation. And we know that that myth doesn't hold up 
under scrutiny. But what I don't think that we've spent as much time thinking about is the transformation of Canada in a post 9-11 world. So I'm going, to, I'm going to phrase my comments around um, the, the drone procur procurement in relationship to the most recent history of 9-11. So as we all know, um, the invasion of Iraq gets premised on a lie. It gets premised on a lie um, told at the UN Security Council by Colin Powell that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. On the Cretan, Canada does not immediately join the war and the invasion, but nonetheless on the Cretan, the development for more transform for transforming Canada into a more hawkish nation begins. And it begins domestically with the announcement of our first kind of supermax prison. So they don't join the war immediately, but they immediately turn to a logic that the terrorists, that the threat is actually at home. So the first thing to do was um, to develop a supermax. And we know that with the development of that supermax, indeed ceases they turn internally and they were able to find all kinds of people who were deemed to be security threats. I think that once we begin to think about how that history begins to transform national politics in Canada, we begin to, we begin to see a number of, I think really important um, moments in the transformation of government and governance of how we are governed, who gets governed, who gets a say in how governance plays itself out. So one of the things that we need to notice is that at the exact time that the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq are prosecuted, that we also see within Western nation states like Canada and the US, multicultural governance and multiracial governance, right? So it's a black man at the UN telling the lie. A black woman is the national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice. And so on the Bush too, we begin to see what we knew already existed at the military level, at Joint Chiefs of Staff and so on, uh, multiracial warriors, but we begin to see their presence in Western governments. And so, um, we see Powell, we see Condoleezza Rice, and then by the time Obama is elected, the sedimentation of multicultural warriors and the face of um, US Western imperialism as a multicultural face becomes cemented. And of course, given the folks who are here, we're all familiar with Obama's, and I, I think Aziza was pointing to this and, and hinting at Yemen and other places, um, Obama's drone wars, we all know about the kill list and so on. I'm rolling all of this out because I think that once we understand that, we also begin to make sense of figures like Harji Sajan and now Anand, Mel uh, sorry, and now Anita Anand and Melanie Jolie, right? So the multiracial gendered nat nature of what constitutes, I forgot to start my timer so I don't go over, of what constitutes um, governance in the West. So the part of what that works to do is it obscures exactly um, the target of the aggression, right? Um, so there's a way in which by having a multiracial um, gendered parity, the claim of, of who are the warriors, the face of the warriors, obscures exactly who's also being prosecuted. And, and so for me, it's really important to understand that we have been in Canada slowly and surely um, transformed into a much more aggressive hawkish nation, not simply through the procurement of hardware, but also through the logic and practice of representation. Um, the faces of the very people who prosecute these wars, who are the faces of the procurement and so on. And so for me, 
it's really important that we begin to understand the relationship between domestic national politics and foreign policy. Because if we don't make those links, then we get snookered into the idea that um, by electing non-white people who then hold cabinet positions, that we're somehow in a process of some kind of deep transformation. When actually what we're doing is we're building a multiracial, multicultural um, warring, warring nation, right? I mean, this is, there's, no, there's no better example in this than you know, the role that Canada has been playing in Haiti since the Cretan years up until now, right? The recent deployment of military aircraft to Haiti just last month. And so for me, the kind of question of the drone program is tied up in all of this. Right. I think Aziz has pointed well to you know all the logics and the language around the sanitization of war through drone technology. Um, less, less of our guys and girls get hurt on the ground, and the overwhelming sense of power means that the opposing side caves in much quickly and so on. So war is now seen as technical, as clean, as anesthetic and piercing. And, and you move on. Of course, we know that's not, that's not the case. And that in fact, the deployment of these representative people are also deployed to quell any kind of unrest at home. So, so the, the, the militarization, the drone militarization has its corollary in the militarization of the police for the to, domestic resistance. So drone programs then, and of course, the drone program is only one part of a significant procurement program of armories as Canada renews its own stock, <laughs> right? So we've got fighter check procurement on its way. We've got the drone program procurement, submarines, I think, helicopters. There, there at least there's a, a significant amount of procurement that is going on or in the pipeline. And one of the things that I think we have to think about is how all of this procurement is also um, offered up as the opportunity for nationally depressed economies, especially on the East Coast, to have access to work, local economies to have access to work, claims around technological transfer, innovation, and all of these kinds of buzzwords that are part now of digital economies, part now of technological economies, and the idea that, you know, places where the fisheries have died, places where factory work has disappeared, that these procurement programs also now bring employment to these, to these repressed areas. And so we have to figure out ways of intervening into these communities where these programs have to land because these, these programs are not, they have to be housed somewhere. And, and the housing of them somewhere means that um, communities become invested in them. Communities become invested in them because they become forms of employment in these deep, economically depressed communities. And so we have to be able to intervene in these communities and organize with people in these communities because there's also so much that we do not know about these technologies, what kinds of health effects they leave behind in their wake um, as they enter communities and so on. So there's a piece of this that's about the kind of economic nature of how war becomes a foundation of economy that we also need to be addressing. And I, 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 and I wanna point to um, something that um, Aziza said, and I think Matt hinted that as well. We know that the catastrophe of climate change that we're already living in is going to produce enormous amounts of unplanned migration. People will literally pick up and move because the places where they're now living will become unlivable. And we know that drone programs are going to be the, antisept the, the antiseptic way to try to insist on and push back against those forms of unplanned migration. And so we really have to begin to think about how climate change, 
already prosecuted wars and other, other um, catastrophic practices are going to produce uh, migrations. And one way of responding to those migrations is not actually to have people greet you at the border, um, but actually to push them back with drones, with drone technology. So if we recall um, in the, towards the end of the Trump, towards the end of the Trump um, years, where there is at the Texas, Mexico border, the, the, the Homeland Security Border Patrol on horses beating back Haitian and other immigrants, something like it was out of a Wild West movie. Um, so we don't want to see that spectacle. The drone allows us not to see that spectacle. Um, and so um, the drone allows, especially for repressed white workers to not feel implicated in certain kinds of anti-migrant politics, all the while being a part of that production. So, you know, the kind of wages of whiteness in the West um, gets sealed up in the question of how these drone programs will be unleashed. And of course, I'm gonna repeat some of our other said, and then they're gonna be unleashed at home. They're already unleashed at home in relationship to the militarization of policing and activists, um, BLM, um, indigenous land, land and water defenders, and so on. So, you know, the kind of question then, of, so what is all of this actually in some ways about? What this is, what, what I'm thinking about as I look at these procurements, as I think about Canada's uh, transformation of itself from the myth of a peacekeeping nation to a hawkish, nation is that we are in a new arms race. Like the, the Russian-Ukraine war makes it very clear that we are in a new arms race, that we are in a new kind of detente cold war. And so, you know, as we, I'm again thinking about, you know, the three quote unquote unidentified objects, the balloon and the others, you know, the so-called scare of China as China overreaches itself as how, as how the West sees it, that we are in this new arms race where the Russia-Ukraine war is one element of its prosecution. And on the other side, there's an attempt to contain China. And so drone procurement and all of this, the procurement of these other armaments have to be read within what is clearly being worked out as new, new realignments in, in the world. And those new realignments have very much to do with the transfer of wealth. So as US capitalism crumbles and, and China state capitalism, continues to be buoyant despite the claims that COVID has impacted it tremendously and so on, we're really seeing a global scramble for the continued hoarding of wealth in the wealthy West. And how has wealth been accumulated and hoarded in the wealth? As Aziza said, true colonial violence. What is called war today is in no uncertain terms, a form of colonial violence. We can look and see who's prosecuting the war, why the wars are being prosecuted, what is being extracted, and it entirely mirrors the long history and logic of, of the colonial wars. But, but related to that also, which is to return to the point that I'm making about military abroad and policing at home, these kinds of drone programs are meant also to produce docile communities at home. Communities that are totally given in to being governed in ways that the facade of democratic representation entirely disappears. So you vote once a year um, or, or you vote every, every four years or every five years, but that's about as much as you really do. Um, any kind, any form of resistance will be greeted by militarized police, drones in the sky, and increasingly the deployment of actually, of, of military forces as well. 
You know, some of you will recall the, the, the kind of fledgling debate about, you know, the use of the Canadian military in moments of quote unquote natural disasters. But these are all moments of a kind of softening up of and a building towards docile populations, populations that will not resist and that will totally give over all governance to the wealthy and the people who work on behalf of the wealthy who are wealthy politicians. So, so this kind of question of governance and the govern is one that is crucially important to me these days. And I know that this, this might seem a little bit off, but I think part of, part of the kind of question that we're faced with is, not only are we faced with the question of um, the procurement of what many of us here would see as unnecessary armament, but it's, it's less the question of that procurement and more the importance of what does this all mean? And part of what we're living now is that we are in a struggle around meaning a deep, significant political struggle around meaning. We're in a struggle about what does it mean to be at war? What, what does war mean? Like for instance, people seem to imagine that in a war, there's something that's called non-combatants, but actually that's a myth of war. <laughs> when you're in war, everyone is in war. It is true that there, there's, there's a difference between who's on the front line and who's not, but civilians are never outside of war. And we 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 know that how we, we know that from every war that we can look at. So there's no such thing as people being outside of the war where the war is prosecuted. So we're in the struggle for meaning, and drones help us to imagine and hold on to these myths around what war is. But we're also in a struggle of meaning around what peace means and what peace might look like. And we're in a struggle of meaning around what justice means and what justice might look like. I'm just gonna end on this note that part of what we have to do is to not collaborate with the undermining of the manner in which we come to make meaning out of the demands for justice that we seek. Of course, in the last few weeks, there was a tremendous amount of back and forth and upset around um, the, the anti-Islamophobia advisor. And I kept asking myself, not so much that this individual, um, that, that Amira should not be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That Amir, the, the kind of slander of Amira was one thing. And I think that it was right that people defended her. But I also wanted to ask Amira, why collude with Trudeau? Why collude with the myth and the logic that the Trudeau government has any interest at all in ending Islamophobia when the prime minister himself can't take a stand on Bill 21? And it's that kind of nuance that we need as we move forward, because what will happen is that people who look like us, people who sound like us, will be the face of this multicultural, multiracial militarism abroad and at home, telling us that it's good for us. So we will, be, we will find ourselves being asked to collude with our own coming deaths, with our own come in docility. And so we have to understand the procurement as the drones within this larger context of who gets to govern, who is governed, and what that will absolutely mean for how we understand what it means to live a life. So I'll stop there. Well, um, much for us to consider. Incredible analysis from Ronaldo Walcott. Vital context is, is so disturbing to think about the dynamism of uh, Canadian imperialism, just the war mongering, the war economy, and, uh, and to consider the implications of this drone warfare and the sanitizing of violence as, as you talk about it, um, and also drone warfare and its intersection with these, these crises that we face, climate change and, and its accompanying forced migration. Thank you so much, Ronaldo. Really, really looking forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A.
Um, before that, we'll be hearing a word from Maya Garfinkel from uh, World Beyond War Canada about the campaign to stop the armed drone purchase. Welcome, Maya. Thank you so much, Bianca, and thank you to all of the incredible panelists thus far. I've, I've truly learned so much today and think that your insights offer such a strong jumping off point for this campaign moving forward. Um, as Bianca mentioned, my name is Maya and I'm the Canada organizer with World Beyond War. Uh, I'm calling in from Tajage, colonially known as Montreal on the traditional territory of the Ghana Kahaga. Um, I'm here to close out this part of the webinar with some brief remarks about this campaign and future plans before we get to Q&A. Um, as you may or may not know, this webinar marks just the second event for the No Armed Drones campaign. As of now, the campaign consists of several groups and individuals dedicated to organizing behind the scenes to mobilize against armed drone procurement. While this is our second public event, organizers have been researching and preparing materials behind the scenes, and this campaign is very much so open to new organizers. Thus far, there has been research writing and letter writing to MPs on drone procurement, and you can find some of this work done um, on the link tree that we've created just a few weeks ago. However, there certainly hasn't been any kind of large scale national conversation about this purchase, or at least the kind that we want to be having. In the coming months, we're really looking for more individuals and groups to write letters, op-eds, letters to the editor, speak to their MPs against Canada's armed drone procurement plan. This is a critical piece of the puzzle that is needed to up the profile of this issue and stop this plan from being pushed through under the noses of the public. The campaign is looking to grow and take a bolder stance with open letters, lobbying, and more. In the case of the drone procurement project we're looking at today, the bidding is underway, but the contract is not yet signed. Consequently, it's critically important for us to take action during this period of limbo before the deal becomes more concrete and the contract is signed, but at the same time when we have the details to really mobilize people around what this deal means. I would be missing a piece of this movement puzzle if I was to leave out the No Fighter Jets movement as a part of this conversation. Um, as many of you know, as of January 9th, we know that Canada has agreed to procure $77 billion worth of F-35 fighter jets, which are really warplanes and have many similar usages to, to armed drones. And while that movement isn't over, we can compare what we're doing in this campaign to that one and see that we're at a much more strategic and, and open point to mobilize people due to the armed drone contract still largely being up in the air. We need to frame this as an opportunity for pro-peace individuals to weaken the military industrial complex and Canadian state violence from the belly of the beast. In the meantime, research is going on behind the scenes in terms of legal inquiries, especially into the legality of the scenarios proposed and legal questions and concerns around the purchase. We're also working on building a more complete webpage and outreach to local contacts in the area where drone bases will be in Canada similar to the network of drone-based communities in the United States. Here on this panel, we represent the interests of war abolition, solidarity with populations highly impacted by armed drones within our colonial borders and beyond, national civil liberty defense, and more. We have the potential to grow this campaign by continuing to emphasize the way in which this procurement project is an intersectional and cross-movement issue at its core. After all, there is a precedent for this type of movement around the world. We actually saw this effectively shift the tides away from armed drones in Germany, where a years long struggle took place to prevent Germany from leasing drones from Israel that could be armed. The topic actually captured the media's and public's attention and the deal was stalled for actually 10 years as a result, which is a pretty amazing feat. That's just one example of the type of movement that we can look to uh, and really build from um, in Canada and beyond. This will really be a campaign in which we want to use creative strategies on multiple levels. So I'm here to tell you that if you're interested in getting involved on a more in-depth level, please reach out to me or any of the organizing groups today. And I'm really confident that there's a place for you in this movement. Um, if you're registered for this event, we'll be reaching out with next steps as the campaign unfolds. Uh, that's it for me though. And I'll be turning it over to Bianca to begin the Q&A. Thanks so much.
Thank you, Maya. Um, thanks for your amazing work on this. Please do join the campaign. This is a great time, uh, particularly given the period of limbo. And there's much, much, much more that needs to be done. So let's, you know, let's register our opposition to this procurement um, and let's try to stop it from happening. So that concludes our presentations. Uh, we're now moving on to the Q&A. Thanks to those of you who put your questions in the chat. Thank you very much for that. Um, so the first question that uh, we have, uh, isn't the use of drone warfare a violation of international law? If it's used on a suspect, um, uh, clear many will die as collateral damage. Will they be able to seek out damage, um, grievances rather? And we also had a question submitted in advance um, where somebody asked uh, where, where do drone killings in remote flight and foreign airspace lie within the context of international law? So I think these two questions are, are linked and uh, maybe we can start with Aziza. Thank you for those, uh, for those questions. Um, in terms of international law, most legal experts have not said that drones are inherently a violation of international law. And, um, this might seem surprising to us, but largely because of laws, imperial foundations, as scholars of third world approaches to international law have pointed out, international law and the international laws of war specifically are steeped uh, in their development in colonial contexts and efforts to justify and rationalize certain kinds of operations of violence against colonized people. Um, Law does not simply restrict violence, it also enables certain kinds of violence in the context of war, for example. It allows people to kill and, and be killed. Um, and not everything that we would consider to be egregious is, is illegal. Many things, in fact, that we would consider to be egregious are not illegal. Uh, certain uses of drones uh, may, in fact, violate international law. Um, in the international laws of war, there are requirements that any military violence uh, a be necessary for um, enacting a legitimate military purpose, also that it discriminate between um, civilians and combatants, and that any damage be uh, proportionate uh, in, in relation to the military um, advantage that is anticipated. So again, these restrict violence in some ways, but then they also legitimize and enable forms of violence that states represent as being necessary and, and, and proportionate. Um, so drones aren't inherently a violation of international law. We can look through the different um, scenarios that of use that the government provides in the letter of interest and see how they match up to international law. To me, the, the uh, scenario that Matt described about the use of the targeted strike against fighting age males, to me that very explicitly is would be a violation of of international law. And it's it's very troubling that the government, far from hiding this, is just sort of casually discussing it in a procurement document as if this is a legitimate, a legitimate, a legitimate exercise of violence. Uh, you know, Ronaldo talked about how in in war there is no um, there are no non-combatants that everyone is everyone is drawn in. But in international law, there is at least formalistically a distinction between combatants who can be targeted and and um, civilians who are supposed to be uh, who are supposed to be immune. Um, and the assumption in international law is supposed to be that people, unless they are very clearly identified as belonging to a military or an armed force, unless they're wearing uniforms and are you know, openly carrying arms, that unless they are very clearly identified as combatants, that the assumption is supposed to be that they are civilians and they are treated as civilians and not targeted unless they are uh, what is called in international law, directly participating in hostilities, which means they are actively engaged in acts of violence. When we look at the scenario in the government's um, letter of interest about the targeting of fighting aged males, <laughs> their criteria for being targeted, for being marked for extermination, is simply that one of them has something that looks like a cell phone and a radio, they're next to a shovel and a wall, they're going past where, you know, a, um, an occupation convoy is passing. In other words, they're effectively marked for death on 
uh, on the basis of nothing other than their identities. That to me is a very clear violation of international law around targeting, even as limited protections as they provide against violence, even in terms of imperial international law, that is that is a violation. And so I think that there are particular scenarios that we can push back against in terms of international law, but of course the danger is that in just pushing back against particular applications and achieving limitations on particular uses uh, that we end up legitimizing the framework of violence as a whole, that it then can represent itself as being uh, restrained and legal because some of the worst excesses of violence have been ruled out, which is why I think it's important that we look at these uh, as, as um, manifestations of Canadian colonial policing and militarism that cannot be reformed and tinkered around the edges, but rather we need to approach it from an abolitionist perspective, a perspective that understands that these are inherently violent technologies, that they are signs of inherent of, of institutions that are inherently violent and that cannot be reformed, but rather must be abolished. Thank you, Aziza. Uh, any other thoughts from, uh, from our panel on the question of international law? Matt? Yeah, just to really quickly um, jump in as well, I, echoing everything that, that Aziza uh, mentioned, but I just want to add in one, one additional uh, thing as well. Just something to note, you know, after um, the, the drone strike, folks may have heard about the drone strike, um, back in in 2021 uh that the united states did that they they initially attempted to cover it up it then admitted that it was a mistake but it killed 10 civilians um there were questions about whether or not those particular drone operators would face any kind of punishment or anything like that the pentagon effectively held its own internal investigation so that it found no evidence of wrongdoing um they they said you know this isn't a leadership issue you know, this is they didn't go outside of the chain of command. They didn't do anything that um, demonstrated that they violated any kind of military, you know, authority. It was it was a it was a mistake, is sort of what they called it. Um, but it wasn't the result of negligence or anything like that. And so, effectively, there there was no accountability held for those uh, individual operators as well. So, there's the questions about you know, can Canada be held viable or liable to you know international law? Um, now we're seeing, you know, actual circumstances where individual operators, um, you know, should be held accountable even within their own chains of command and were not, right? As, as far as we're aware, nobody was demoted, nobody was punished, nobody, you know, there was no consequence for that kind of action. And so um, we're seeing really that uh, there's the ability for countries to operate these systems largely with impunity. Um, you know, both in terms of on the, the grand government scale and also for, for the individual operators that are that are working with the systems. Thank you. Yeah, can I, I just, mean, could I add one more thing? Just quickly, yes. which is, um, so the UN Special Rapporteur on the protect, protection of uh, fundamental rights in counterterrorism recently released a position paper on the use of armed drones from the perspective of international law. And many of the features that she identifies as most concerning are features of uh, Canada's procurement and the way that they've talked about using drones. Specifically, the fact that armed drones are now being um, explicitly talked about in terms of, of policing context, and the fact that there is no legal framework provided to even hypothetically or theoretically guide the use of these drones. And so I think what we do right now here in Canada to push back against these, because these are emerging features of uh, the way that drone use is evolving in very concerning ways. What we do now here also has international implications for the types of precedents of uh, resistance that are set. Thank you. If, if I if I if I may, I I totally agree with everything everyone has said. I just I think it's really important though to stress that international law. I think it's easy. You 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 began there. Is so deeply embedded in the history of colonial expansion and domination that it remains a, a moving target. So who's subject to international law and who um, is bought before um, the Hague and so on, who has even signed on um, becomes a part of the conversation of how we think like of how we think about 
um, who might be subject to sanction by, by international law. So when Matt just talked about the 21 um, drone strike, um, well, the US has not signed onto the court. Um, no senior US official has ever been asked to account internationally for any sort of, I'm not even gonna call it war crime, I'm just gonna call it war transgression. <laughs> so we are in, in a territory where we know, and that's why I'm using the language of the West, where we know that the West, but international law for the West is a moving target and it moves always in their favor. Um, so this it's something that's really important for us to hold on to as we think about what kinds of claims we make in relationship to a campaign in Canada to interrupt the drone procurement, because it seems to me that uh, a more hawkish Canada is fully aware that it too can exempt itself from international law. So the next question that we have that was submitted in advance, um, what do we expect Canadian drones to be used on uh, is the first part of the question. And if Canada had had these drones 15 years ago, would they have been used in Afghanistan or Libya? Does anyone want to tackle that one? Well, we know that they're, go they're going to be used domestically and internationally. And, and we know that, yes, of course, if they had them 15 years ago, they would have. And when they've had opportunity to, as, as Matt's presentation pointed to, they have made use of them. So um, the kind of question is, for me, the question is, what's at stake for Canada in moving into um, this particular arena? I mean, one of the things that I didn't mention is, but one, one of the things that we have to account for, you know, um, is Canada as a significant international um, mining, in, in, in international interest in mining. And as we look around parts of South America, Latin America and Africa, did some of the resistance to many of these corporations that are registered as Canadian corporations and engaging in egregious forms of exploitation and murder and so on. And one begins to think that, you know, something like a drone program is not only in relationship to wars that are in progress of being prosecuted, but this is why I'm interested in this idea of docile communities and what it means to create docile governed people. Um, because I, one can imagine seeing um, these drones also deployed in those areas where people are rising up against Canada's mining interests. And so we are entering uh, a, a phase in, in the life of Canada as a colonial state that really demands that we begin to connect a whole bunch of things um, because it seems to me that the consequences of not connecting those things could be really dire for us. Thank you, Ronaldo. Anyone else uh, have some thoughts? Matt, had you wanted to weigh in? I, I mean, I think. No, no, Ronaldo covered covered everything <laughs> much well, so more I eloquently think... than I could. Uh, well, so I think to get a uh, concrete idea about the way that these are likely to be used, we can look both in depth at the scenarios that the government itself has said are its hypothesized uses. And we can also look at how um, the countries that Canada is procuring these drones from have used these drones. So in terms of the scenarios, Matt uh, talked uh, in, in, in depth about two of them, the striking of uh, fighting age males in Afghanistan, um, and then the surveillance of anti-capitalist uh, protesters. And in the letter of interest, it's interesting that they're explicitly described as um, anti-capitalist protesters. So it's clear that in terms of what they see as being an ideological threat, it's not white supremacist and right-wing extremist violence. It's anti-capitalists, which again speaks to uh, Ronaldo's point that he made earlier about how we know that this government is not actually interested in addressing structural racism, Islamophobia. In fact, it's deeply invested 
in maintaining uh, these forms of violence while using uh, the representation of certain private actors as extremists uh, that it's acting against as a way of shielding its own deeply institutionalized uh, embedded forms of racism and colonialism from scrutiny. Uh, so those are the two scenarios that Matt discussed. And then some of the other scenarios are for um, use of surveillance of, again, what it describes in the uh, letter of interest as illegal migrants, um, under international law, again, talking about uh, violations of even this imperial international law, um, it's not clear how you determine, uh, even if we're accepting the idea that any migrant can be illegal, even within the terms of this, uh, this body of law that permits the illegalization of certain migrants and asylum seekers, even within the terms of this, it's not clear how they determine in advance whether or not these migrants are illegal. Uh, the LOI specifically talks about that these are uh, migrants from Tamil areas of Sri Lanka. And so again, here we see the use of racial criteria being used to determine who counts as illegal versus who counts as legitimate and illicit. Um, in European countries that have been using drones for migrant surveillance purposes, we know horrifically that drones are now being used to absolve states of their obligation to rescue seafarers and migrants in distress uh, by avoiding having any human presence in the in the in the waters while simultaneously exercising their human powers of surveillance. In other words, it's a way yet again to exercise violence and surveillance without undertaking any corresponding responsibilities against those whom violence is being exercised. We also know that drone footage is uh, now being used to criminalize migrants for human traffickers and that very harsh sentences, uh, extremely harsh sentences, which again, speak to the underlying brutality of the carceral state, that it penalizes most those who are precarious and fleeing violence rather than those who are perpetrating the violence, the, um, the arms dealing and the environmental devastation from which people are fleeing. Drone footage is now being used in cases in order to uh, criminalize migrants as human traffickers. There are some reports on this if people are interested in just, again, the grotesque and Kafkaesque legal logic that is being used uh, to effect this. Um, another scenario is for use against uh, armed reconnaissance of Somali pirates. Again, people who are largely responding to situations of colonial depredation of, of fisheries and seas off of the East African coast who are now represented as pirates uh, who these transnational uh, corporations uh, fishing boats as well as um, boats that are um, transporting fossil fuel. Those waters are a vital transport corridor for the global fossil fuel industry. In other words, uh, as we see corresponding with the um, with, with the disciplining and the and the rejection and pushing back of uh, migrants, including those who are fleeing climate change, is the protection of the ability to continue depredating uh, depredating those uh, very uh, ecosystems uh, which uh, are causing whose depredation is causing such devastation and requiring people to flee. Um, in the first place. And then just very quickly, uh, in terms of how other states have been using these, I don't think it's a coincidence that the states from which Canada is planning to procure these drones, the United States and Israel, are both also settler colonial states. We know that both have been using them against um, Indigenous peoples who are resisting colonial violence. In the United States, in fact, the uh, first state to authorize the use of um, armed drones in policing was North Dakota, which was also the site of the uprising at Standing Rock and resistance against the Dakota Access Pipeline. We know drones were used there to, um, uh, to enact violence against indigenous land and water protesters, while indigenous peoples themselves were criminalized for using drones to document police violence. In Israel, Israel is an innovator in the use of, of drones. They've just recently um, pioneered the technique of swar swarming drones, which is where entire groups of drones network with each other and can act uh, relatively autonomously in order to overwhelm a target. Israel is also a pioneer in the use of kamikaze or suicide drones. Um, and these are all being battle tested against Palestinians. And then they are yet profiting yet again from selling the fruits of that repression uh, to Canada. Again, I don't know if this is something that can be legally challenged. It's something I've been thinking about. I don't think it is, precisely because law as it exists has been built to ratify colonial violence.
Um, there's a couple more, there's a couple of questions um, maybe we can just touch on quickly uh, that are uh, in the legal realm. Desmond wants to know whether there's a push for an international treaty on drones as there was with landmines. Does anyone know the answer to that? I, I'm not familiar with uh, with any pushes for an international treaty, but um, it's a good question. Scott uh, Asma wants to know um, how are the pe how are people in Afghanistan, for instance, supposed to document or track civilian deaths uh, for boots on the ground organizations? Um, is this is this something that any of our panelists have been thinking about? Um, sort of the the the, the victims of of drone warfare and their capacity to, to resist and organize. Matt. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to just um, touch on that really briefly. The, there's an organization, just to sort of give you an example of how, how this sort of activity can work. There's an organization called Air Wars. Um, I believe they're based in the, U the UK, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but they, they do exactly this kind of on the ground tracking and monitoring of, of to the best of their ability, every single drone strike that takes place and every casualty associated with those strikes, um, doing their best to identify them, you know, as, acquire as much information as possible. I think the idea being um, to, to either help, you know, raise awareness for news, you know, news coverage, or potentially to contribute to some kind of legal action in the future as sort of an evidentiary basis. But um, yeah, they're called air wars. So there, there are folks doing this kind of work. It's, it's possible. It's incredibly emotionally exhausting. I've spoken to some folks involved in this work, and it's um, really, really difficult work to do. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, it's not easy. On the subject of activism, we do have two questions uh, around organizing. Um, the first, how are efforts to get the Canadian left involved with social justice movements, racial justice movements, defunding, demilitarizing, the police speaking out on imperialism overseas, um, and demanding Canada's military um, secret service be abolished? So I guess this is sort of general state of the Canadian left um, around the issues of demilitarization. And then another question is how difficult has it been to mobilize people against drones when just like the fighter jets, uh, Bernie Sanders in the US and similar left-leaning politicians support this. The NDP is overwhelmingly in favor of weapons like this and fighter jets, uh, many subscribe to it. If it's a <clears throat> bin Laden or someone, they deserve to be droned to avoid a 9-11 is the question. Um, I, I think I'm gonna direct this to, to Maya. Yeah, I'm happy to take this uh, huge question on. <laughs> um, question. I, it's a huge question and it is kind of the question um, for peace movement people in general right now. It's obviously not a super popular time to be pro-peace or anti-weapons or whatever you want to call it. Um, and for me, when I think about this question, I think about how we can connect to people um, who are located in the belly of the beast like we are who are located in Canada in places where we are, you know, constituents of, of people who make the decisions to buy these kinds of weapons. Um, and I think about connecting it to issues that people have an easier time to connect to, to connect their security and well-being to. And um, when people think of buying weapons, including armed drones, they think of that as an investment in their security. And I think it's really important that we switch that narrative and this kind of connects to Scott's question down the line that I see there, switching that narrative to, um, to thinking of security as something that we can ensure through investment in, in climate, investment in economic well-being, in jobs, all those really important things um, and really you know, debunking this idea that increased security and militarization equals increased you know, day-to-day -day well-being, because we know that's not the case. And I think I would be leaving out a piece of this if I wasn't to say that, of course, the defund the police and BLM movement has played a huge role in making those connections in North America between demilitarization and opposing state violence um, and meeting people's needs. Like specifically in Toronto, they've done an amazing job of connecting, you know, defund the police fund supports was a big campaign that happened recently and is ongoing. So that's sort of the really, really brief answer of what I think of when I think of mobilizing people because it is a difficult task. 
Thank you, Maya. Definitely a tough time to be a peace activist. Ronaldo. Yeah, I mean, part of the point that I was trying to make in my comments was about a part of this. If you listen to um, Anita Anand in the announcement for the procurement of the fighter jets, for example, there was a lot of rhetoric around creating jobs for people, for where those jets would be. And so part of the thing that those of us who, who are, are involved in organizing or trying to help folks to rethink these questions is to offer a different account of the economy and what is necessary to be done in areas of, in pockets of the national where the economies are depressed and that the procurement of these kinds of armories seem to offer an out. And so part of it has to do with, on the one hand, folks are told, well, you know, if you, if you have these submarines, if you have these fighter jets, if you have these drones, it's gonna bring high paying technological jobs to your neck of the woods. So that's one side of it. On the other side, they're also being told that we need these things to keep the barbarians out. who are gonna come and take your jobs, come and make your, 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 your women and children feel unsafe, and so on. So, so the forces of militarism and ongoing colonialism have become really skilled at using the very things that are reproducing the continuous ongoing violence as also a kind of source for sustenance, right? If we think about all of the people who join private police forces and police forces who come from working class communities and make it into the police force as a kind of secure, form of employment. So one of the things that we now can see very clearly by thinking about the important philosophy of abolition is that abolition, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, requires that we change everything. So we have to become far more skilled than anybody in the NDP, than Bernie Sanders or any of these people to be able to talk about and imagine other modes of economy that move well beyond capitalism, other modes of organizing how we live together collectively that are far more persuasive and are located in really deep logics of not just care, but interdependence. Because what drives all of this is a sense that we can actually, um, that we can on the one hand militarize and on the other hand, use that, that militarization to produce forms of life that are going to be adequate and they can never be. But that's what's on offer to people. Like people on the East Coast want to get those submarines because it promises jobs when the fishery is gone. They want to have access to, the, to the, what's being told are high paying technological jobs that will service, that will service these these fighter jets and so on. And so we, we have to begin to really develop a different kind of logic. And of course, for white people in places like Canada, you know, the fear is that it's all these people who are not white who are coming and that they're gonna be swallowed up, right? So, you know, the great replacement theories, all of this stuff, right, is right there. And so we have to be much more fluent in how we talk about this. And, and how we get at the crux of what's really at stake. Matt, can you chime in on the, the jobs argument? Yeah, sure. Just two, two really quick points to add on to um, what Ronaldo has said already. And I, I fundamentally agree with, with everything that's been said, um, but there's, there's two distinct points that I wanna make. And, and so, you know, as, as Ronaldo mentioned, we, we always hear that one of the primary justifications for this is, is about jobs, right? About these big military programs. But there's been some really phenomenal work that's been done, um, a, a, you know, especially in the United States, you know, pushing back against some of these big, big cost programs there. Um, and I'm thinking of the, the Costs of War Project at Brown University they have found that defense spending is amongst the least productive industries that is used to create jobs. And so they've, they've done several calculations on this. They found that for the same amount of spending um, you know, that you inject into the defense sector, 
You can create 40% more jobs through clean energy and infrastructure. You can create uh, 100% more jobs by investing in healthcare. You can create 120% more jobs by investing in education, right? So there are, defense spending is, is always amongst the least productive ways of government injecting jobs into a community. The second thing that I just wanna mention is we have done a lot of digging into the projections that militaries often use to estimate job creation. And there are some very serious anomalies into how they make those predictions. So typically governments will say that defense programs will support what are called the direct and indirect jobs. Direct jobs are easy to estimate because it is like literally the number of jobs that are used to build that particular system and deploy that particular system. Indirect jobs are much, much more squishy um, and they typically refer to very vague amounts of economic support that is granted to communities where military programs are headquartered. So for example, the money that is injected into a community by more people shopping at grocery stores or sending your kids to a school in that community, right? The government will use that data to create what is called like an, uh, an indirect job multiplier. And these multipliers are often decades old, they don't correspond to, to reality. And so when we hear that militaries say this program creates X number of jobs or it supports X number of jobs, it's not like those 20,000 people that are, are getting jobs out of nowhere, whereas they didn't have jobs before. Those numbers are, are typically kind of, you know, a, a little bit out of thin air, right? And so I would, I would really exercise caution, not even just with the, the drone program, but with all major military programs, when we hear about job creation, we should be really interrogating those numbers and finding out precisely what those multipliers are that they're using, because chances are, if Canada is anything like the United States, where I do most of my research, they are wildly out of date and they, they don't map to reality at all. Well, Aziza? Um, I just wanted to quickly say, since the question is about how we resist these things on the left, I think we need to be extremely careful that on the left, we're not reproducing the same logic and arguments that are used to justify violence in the first place. So often when we talk about resisting drones, some of the types of arguments that are made are, for example, that it ends up causing more uh, Muslim quote unquote terrorism in, a, in return in a way which represents the ultimate threat as being, again, the threat po of violence posed by the barbarian or the savage rather than the inherent violence of of uh, drone militarism and imperialism itself. We often hear uh, statistics around uh, women and children casualties being used as a proxy for who are innocent, undeserving civilian casualties of drones in a way which then entrenches the idea that Muslim men are presumptively guilty and expendable unless proven otherwise. We also hear, um, particularly in the American context, a uh, rejection of the idea that the government can kill its own citizens, American citizens by drone in a way which reinforces the idea that people who are not citizens um, have no have no rights, have no right to be killed, have no recourse. We know citizenship is an inherently violent concept in settler colonial states. It's been built on the dispossession and colonization of indigenous peoples and the exclusion of migrants and, and people from uh, the non-Western world who may be imported on precarious terms in order to perform labor, but are denied any of the security or rights that come with that come with belonging. Um, anytime we use these types of arguments, even when we might think we might be minimizing the categories of people who are subject to violence, we end up reinforcing the idea that these forms of violence are not inherently illegitimate and that there are people against whom it is permissible to use them. Something that I've learned from prison abolitionists um, very clearly is how we defend abolition for everyone. Prison and carceral systems are inappropriate for anyone, even the people who are represented as most violent and most violent and most irredeemable. Because as long as the justification exists to use it against some, it will be used um, more broadly and even against all. And I think we need to apply the same um, logic to our resistance against drones and be very careful about not reproducing that uh, racial uh, logic that deems some to be um, in it, some to be inherently innocent at the expense of representing others as inherently targetable and disposable.
Thank you, Aziza. So uh, we've come to the end of our time. Um, maybe just one final question has been touched upon quite a bit, um, particularly uh, in Ronaldo's comments around the multicultural face of war and imperialism. But Scott wants to know, and maybe if you have any final thoughts, how do we counter the co-opting of language and culture by the state and other political actors? Um, and, specifically with reference to um, these drone purchases. Any final thoughts on this from our panel? I mean, I'll say that, you know, we need to be really clear headed about the, um, I can't think of the word right now, it just, it just so I'm going to have to use this about the slickness of the modern neoliberal state. We have to be really clear-headed about it. It is willing to, as, as someone who I admire said about the university, but the neoliberal state is just like a university. It will eat up its most cogent critics without, like, with no, with, like, like if it has no, like, you know, it will eat them up and it will turn them back out to you as if they are a representation of some kind of transformation. And so we have to be really clear headed that this is why I want to talk about this idea that we're in a struggle for meaning. We have to be really clear about what we mean when we say we want peace. We have to be really clear about what we mean when we say we want justice. Because otherwise, justice does end up looking like a black president of the USA who has a killer list. If not, justice ends up looking like, you know, a South Asian woman, Anita Anand, and a white woman, Melanie Jolie, prosecuting war. Canada is right now at war with no declaration of war, right? So we have to be really clear about what we mean, because if we're not clear about what we mean, we get offered meanings that are absolutely deadly and stay within the frame of the long history of brutality that so many of us have been living with. Well, I think that's an excellent note on which to end our discussion. I want to thank our panelists for a brilliant, important, timely, timely panel. Let's build pressure to end this purchase. You can sign the letter to the Canadian Minister of Defense opposing the drone purchase that Karen has put in the chat. Get involved with the campaign. Get in touch with Mayan World Beyond War. Please do share the recording um, of this event with your friends as well and colleagues. It's important to pass on this information and the hashtag is hashtag no armed drones for Canada. Um, as our panelists have stated in the midst of a climate emergency with growing inequity, armed drones are far from what we need uh, to keep us safe. That is not real security. Let's call on our government to invest in real security, healthcare, housing, environment, education, communities, and on and on. Thank you so much to uh, all of you at home for tuning in and for your excellent questions. It's been a great evening. Thanks again to our speakers, Maya, Ronaldo, Aziza, Matt, and thanks to the organizers of today's event, Just Peace Advocates, World Beyond War Canada, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, and the Yellowhead Institute. Um, as always, stay informed, stay engaged. Uh, good night, everyone. Peace. <laughs>